And joining us now from London to discuss the ongoing crisis at Japan's Fukushima nuclear plant is Professor Robin Grimes, the director of the Imperial Centre for Nuclear Engineering, the Imperial College London. Uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, has your early optimism uh, now been proven wrong about how well the Japanese were handling this crisis? Well, I think the uh, early optimism that the containment would uh, manage to hold all the radiation in is definitely uh, over overconfident. Um, there has been uh, releases of radiation, particularly in the vicinity of the uh, reactor buildings, and uh, that's always a cause for concern. I mean, a few days ago, you thought they were handling the event so well, it was an endorsement of the safety of modern nuclear reactors. Uh, have you changed your mind on that, just to start with? Well, I mean, I want to really stress the difference between a modern nuclear reactor and this Generation 1 nuclear reactor. There are certain design features of this Generation 1 reactor uh, which really uh, would not be allowed, would, would uh, actually uh, never have passed muster uh, anywhere else. Uh, it's really quite uh, surprising in many ways. The Generation 2 reactors, uh, and there are a number of them in the same region, remember, in Japan, have all performed very well. And in fact, they're back up and generating, and many of them were back up and generating before the conventional power stations. It's the specifics of this very old Generation 1 reactor. And what are the specifics? What are the things that worry you about its design? What is it that's made it particularly yeah. vulnerable to this kind of accident? So there are two things that uh, would not uh, be uh, able to pass a safety inspection uh, for a new reactor at the moment. And one of them is the idea that they have this large condensing ring, this donut-shaped thing that we've been hearing about, uh, which is actually outside the containment vessel. In a modern design, anything to do with the reactor in which the primary uh, circuits are, are concerned would have to be within a very strong containment vessel. I mean, the containment vessels have, have actually done very well, despite the fact that this is a 40-year-old reactor. It's these donut-shaped exterior structure that seems to have uh, failed uh, in, in a couple of the cases to some extent. So that's one thing. The second thing is the, the arrangement of the spent fuel ponds, which are sort of, again, in a sort of donut at the top of the reactor. Uh, having a very large mass and having the spent fuel very close to the reactor in that way is not something that we would do anymore. And in fact, again, the Generation 2 type reactors are not built like that. And the kind of reactors that the world may be building in the future, Generation 3 reactors, are, are different even again from that. Is it clear how the water seems to have disappeared from these containment ponds which contain the fuel rods? Because that's now what appears to be mm. the biggest problem. Uh, and the Americans are saying the water is entirely boiled off in at least one of, the, one of these pools uh, in uh, Reactor 4. Yeah, there are two very good points you're making there. The first is that the Americans seem to be disagreeing with, with the Japanese. And so I, I don't... I can't see how this can be a matter of semantics. I mean, either there is some water or there isn't some water. Um, how that water uh, left, because certainly um, the Japanese are, are, are stating clearly that there is considerable water loss in, the, in number four. And I would imagine that must be due to some earthquake damage, some cracking or something like that. Now, in addition to that, because now the reactors are uncovered and the water's not being replenished into those spent fuel tanks, then evaporation will be occurring. And the evaporation rate is, you know, a metre or so a day. I, I honestly don't have the exact figure, but it's of that order. So after a few days, unless you replenish the tanks, the levels do start to go down. And if the water levels go down, then the temperature inside the tanks will go up. Because the fuel rods themselves generate heat and ultimately begin they to do. melt and release radioactive isotopes into the atmosphere. Is that right? And th so the big question is, that's, the big question right. is how much... Uh, of this yeah. material is in those tanks and how much uh, could potentially be released into the atmosphere? Now, again, remember that these are 40-year-old tanks and they've had spent fuel in them for all of that time or almost all of that time. So there will have been a build-up in the bottom of the tanks of small amounts of radioactive materials. Um, that would be due to the radiation affecting the sort of waters and, and things would have, have moved into the water, you know, dust particles and so forth. So when you first start to get um, release of the water from those tanks, you'll start to detect some of that radiation. So what we've been seeing, I think, is actually detection not necessarily of burst fuel rods initially, 
but actually of this sort of residual radiation that, that's um, around the tanks anyway. Latterly, we will almost certainly have seen um, the effects of the actual fuel pins themselves, which will have broken open, which would have become very distorted and so forth. So there are different types of radiation. That's why it's so crucial to keep watching, keep monitoring, and find out not what the situation is at any one minute, but how that situation is changing with time. That tells you much more. Well, there are incredibly high levels of radiation, as we know, above uh, Reactor 4, and in fact, above the whole complex. Now, the helicopters can't go anywhere near it, so they have to drop water from a, a very long right. distance up in the air. So if, if yes. very high levels of radiation are being detected above the reactor, that means there's a plume does it not? And what's in that plume? That's what people want to know. Are they radioactive isotopes, dangerous ones like iodine and cesium? Right. So, so again, um, remember you've got the water tanks now. Uh, the, the tops of the covers in number four has been blown off, and now the water level's dropped, which means the spent fuel has no longer got water on top of it. Now, the water actually has two jobs. It just... Not, doesn't just cool the fuel, but it also acts as a radiation barrier. Turns out water is a really magnificent radiation barrier. So if there's exposed fuel and, there's an, and it's open to the atmosphere, then anything flying over the top of it will, will get um, radiation fr directly from the fuel rods, irrespective as to whether they're broken or not. And what's, what, um, what, and however, just, just briefly, we're, we're nearly out of time, but what's to stop that going into a Sorry. very large cloud? of dangerous radioactive isotopes that then descends on a major city like Tokyo? Ah, right. Yeah, very good. Very good question. So there are two different ways in which radiation affects things. There's this sort of, there's like a turning on a torch, if you like, and if the fuel pins are exposed, it's like a, a torch being turned on uh, and the water level goes down. It's like taking the cover off the torch. So suddenly there's a, there's a bright amount of radiation, and that's called shine. In addition to that, you're absolutely right, some of those broken fuel rods will have given up some of their radioactive particles, and those radioactive particles then go up into these um, plumes, and they take the radiation inside the particles away from the site, and that would include certain amounts of cesium and iodine. The good news, if there is any good news, is that most of the iodine, in particular, in the spent fuel, will have decayed away because the spent fuel's been in the ponds for a sh uh, quite a long time, and radioactive uh, iodine has a relatively shorter half-life than many of the other fish and products. Yes, but, but nevertheless, but, uh, it is I'm a just, we, we nearly have time, but I should say the bad news, uh, I imagine, would be that it's not yep. only spent fuel rods in those ponds, but active fuel rods which were taken out for maintenance purposes. So, it, potentially, there's much higher levels of radioactive material in those ponds. No, those, th those types of fuel rods, irrespective of whether they are spent or whether they've come out part of the way through their active, useful life, have the same, basically the same radiation coming from them. Okay, they, all it's right. pretty much the same stuff. Okay. Robin Grimes, we thank you very much for taking the time to come and talk to us tonight. You're very welcome. Thank you.